If you wanted to build yourself a space shuttle, or perhaps put solar heating in your house, this is where you'd start, probably, in a book. And how about this beauty? It's the fattest book I've ever seen. And this is just reports on computer applications in medical care, just for 1980. Well, we're all familiar with this way of storing information, or as it's known in computer jargon, data. It's been around for thousands of years, but now it's running into trouble. These books are not the sort of light reading you'd want to take away with you on holiday. For example, we've got here the Soviet technical physics letter. And you can see, imagine, dear Ivan, I want to talk to you about the effect of an external electric field on the velocity of a surface acoustic wave in a lithium niobate single crystal. Or even, even more exciting, and not many people really believe this, goodbye to the flush toilet. This is a comparative intellectual treatise on the flush privy versus the composting toilet. Perhaps it would be useful in the Himalayas. We're in the science section of the British Library with 85,000 books. But this is only part of it. This is one of seven such buildings around London. This library alone subscribes to 25,000 different journals and periodicals, weekly, quarterly, monthly, so that this information is growing at an incredible rate. That leaves us with two problems. First of all, what are we going to do with all this paper? And secondly, how to find that idea buried in all this paper that will make me into a millionaire? Well, let's go back a little bit. What is writing all about? Well, it's putting ideas or words into symbols. Now, it just so happens that I have here with me a page from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And these are patterns representing ideas or words. For example, very simply, the Wrigley lines are representing water. This represents purity, a newly hatched chick. So what can we do to reduce the size of all this data? Well, one way is to put it onto a computer. And to do that, we have to convert the words, the characters, and the numbers into patterns that the computer itself can handle. To the ancient Egyptians, these hieroglyphic symbols did very well as a way of representing their ideas in permanent and storable form. And we have our own equivalent in the form of the letters of the alphabet and the signs we use for numbers. They all work because our eyes are very good at recognizing shapes and patterns. But a machine needs something much, much simpler, like a punched card, for example. All the machine has to do here is use its little metal finger to track across each column and see if there's a hole or not, and if there is, where it is. You don't need modern electronic machines to do it. In fact, it's a system which has been in use for a long time. You don't see a lot of these around. It's an old 40-column card reader, uh, a card sorter. It's a nice piece of antique. But the principle's the same as was used in the old census done in 1890 by the Americans. And it just each of these columns, in fact, stores one character, either an alphabetic character, A, B, C, or a number. And you can set up on this one column at a time to sort them out into order. What sort of job could it do? Well, for example, if this was a census card and uh, column 15, um, the age of the child was punched in between naught and nine, and I suppose they put many in naught, we put, we set this up to the appropriate column, we put the cards in, we press the button, And here we have, on pocket nine, all the children who are nine years old with all their details, their names and addresses. And the real secret is you could take all these cards again, take them out, and then reuse them again for another analysis you wanted to do. So it's hardly surprising that this machine has been superseded because I suppose what you really want is the information contained in the holes in the cardboard rather than having to shuffle all the bits of cardboard around, and that's where computers come in, I bet. Well, that's exactly right. And if you look at the way it's stored on a card, we just snip off a column of information here, and you can see quite clearly the problem. There is one character. Absolutely and that's right. the equivalent. And in fact, you don't... It, it, the computer doesn't just see if one space has got a hole or no hole in it. It's checking for all of them, and there are many permutations, aren't there? Or, or, well, all possible combinations. In, in, in eight bits, it's, now, it's called a byte, by eight, a byte, and yes. in those eight, there are 256 possible combinations. And that would, they would be used to represent, for example, uh, 
all the alphabetics, uh, upper and lower case, uh, numbers naught to nine, and all the special symbols, plus, minus, left bracket, and so on and so forth. And that's all stored in the famous revolution, the microchip, isn't it? And it's, it, it's all done in a very, very small space. What is that? What's the process inside there? Well, I like to think of it as a sort of series of pots and some are full of electricity, and if you like, they're in eight, and some are full of electricity, some are empty. And you can read out and detect out of those eight which is full and which are empty. And from that you know what the combination is and what character it represents to the computer. So, given that the information can be stored, we can sort it out in any way we choose. We can display it, we can count it, and we can scan it, looking for any particular item we want at fantastic speed. Uh, Mac has been to see how the British Library's computer index works. And the first thing to do is to connect the library's terminal through the telephone to any one of a number of large computer databases. In this case, in another part of London. Well, I'm looking for the application of uh, microcomputers or computers in the home. Where do you think we should start? Computers? Okay, we'll try computers first of all. It takes no time at all for the computer to search through its entire database. But if you're not careful, you can easily end up with a lot more than you bargained for. Oh, that's a problem. 48,818 references on computers. Well, that's far too many for me to read. Um, let's cut that down. I'm really interested in microcomputers rather than general computers. Let's see if that cuts it down at all. Uh, uh, let's try the word microcomputer then. So to cut down the numbers, you can ask it to search again and again, matching on different words. 7,559. We've got to thin that down. I'm not going to read 7,559 reference. What about uh, home? Let's try home. Yes, we'll try... What we can do is try to select those with home where it occurs in the title. And that's how we do that. Well, that's more likely to give us a manageable number. I've got it. Um, so a smaller set now, 46. We're down to 46. That's, that looks more reasonable. Can we look at what they're about? We'll get yes. some titles out anyway and see what we've got. I'm asking the computer to type out the first five, just as a sample. Now we've matched on personal computers with the word home in the title. Electronics in the home, that looks good. And here are several references. Home computers, that's OK. No pet peeves, whatever that is, and the professor rests at home. Adapting a home computer for data acquisition. Well, can we, can we have a look at a bit more detail of the um, right. of electronics in the home? Yes, we can print out the first one with a bit more detail. When you've finally narrowed it down, it doesn't just give you the number of books, but an abstract of the content of the book itself. The orbit shows how the expanding thrust of electronics is likely to penetrate and influence our home environment of the 1980s. The home of the future, is likely to become a centre for incoming and outgoing electronic signals which will be used by members of the family to meet their particular needs. Well, out of all those thousands of books, we managed to find the journal that that was in. And you got Where it very it quickly too. Yes. But why, uh, for a job like that, do you have to use your computer to talk to another computer? Why not have all the information in a box like that? If you take a book like this, this has approximately 400 words on a page. Right. And so if you look at the screen of this television, on that, that's, you'd need three screens like this f to be the same as one page. So that's quite small. The 32,000 characters in here is about 12 pages in this book. So when you start talking about books, that 32,000 seems relatively small. And that's obviously why you have to extend your storage capacity by using tapes or floppy disks, that kind of, that kind of system. Okay. Yes, the, the tape or the, this small floppy, that would handle about, at its maximum packing, its maximum amount it could store, would handle about a whole volume, uh, the characters in a whole volume. And this is about twice the diameter. About, yes, it's about yeah. double the amount of characters. That would hold about 1.2 million characters as a maximum. Right. And for really big storage jobs, I suppose you need those uh, really big hard disk memory banks, is that right? Well, this one isn't one of the biggest. It's a, it's a sort of medium-sized machine. And this disk will hold about 80 of those novels, or the and characters that's, out that's of 80 of those novels. not just one disk, is it? There are several. No, there are five disks here, and the heads go in between to read the data, which is stored mm. magnetically on those disks. And we can load it on the machine quite simply like this, bang, bang. 
Oh, and there's the magnetic surface. It, in fact, it looks like magnetic tape, sort of laid out in, a fame, in the form of a flat gramophone record, it's, almost. Well, it's exactly the same principle, of course, um, but it's obviously much faster to access it, just like a gramophone record. You can pick an individual item of data out on it. Right. Mind your thumb. <laughs> and again, the bigger the machine, the bigger the storage capacity. Yes, this particular machine, although not a very big mainframe machine, it has, in fact, got a million bytes of storage, as opposed to the 32,000 that this little micro has. But the breakthrough is going to come with, I think, uh, this, which is the uh, video disc. And this will store the characters on this one disc that you'd need 3,000 books to store. And another way of putting it, for example, with cassette tape, it would require enough cassette tape to stretch from London to Chicago, and it would take four years to read that cassette tape. <laughs> the capacity to store the equivalent of 3,000 books is um, like the size of an encyclopedia. Well, you'd actually get the whole of the Encyclopedia Britannica on this disc. Well, let's just peep into the future for a moment, and uh, we've got a little programme lined up here, which could be the Encyclopedia of the Future, if I type in Space Shuttle. And there's your page of information. The book is open for you. And to make the page move so it can carry on reading it, all you have to do is press the space bar. What's more, this is something a video disc could do in the future. Not only do you have pages of written information, but if you typed in the word picture, and this is what you get, and make it move by doing that. But uses like that for the video disc are still a long way in the future. Because the computer can store and manipulate such vast amounts of information, we're only now beginning to discover ways to use it.